Can we give them another amen? amen? Thank you for that, and thank you, praise team, for, for the worship this morning. Um, I don't know if this is a point of contention for, for Americans, but Charles Naismith is actually Canadian. Um, yeah, which, which makes one of the greatest sports a, a Canadian-made sport. Yeah, I, there's a lot of good things from Canada. I was in kindergarten class today teaching, and I asked them if they knew where Canada was, and they said, oh, it's on top of America. And I was like, it is. <laughs> it is. Um, good morning, Calamesa. Oh, we can do a little better than that. Hey, help us up there up top. Good morning, Calamesa. Um, today is the last day of our series, Following Where God Leads, and ever since January, we have been on this adventure with our good friends Moses and Joshua. And today we are finishing up uh, our series in Joshua 24, the last chapter before Joshua dies. And it is his last words for the people Israel. And this is a big deal because Israel's identity um, post Slavery has always been with a leader. First Moses, then Joshua. And not just any leader, not some good political king or someone who can get the people working. No, a leader who has like a special blessing of God with him. And Joshua is here and he is 110 years old, um, we know, which is a feat that only happens in Loma Linda. Um, and he is getting worried for this new era of Israel. An era that, as we, you'll find if you explore in Judges, is kind of leaderless. We go from having Moses and Joshua, now what? And Joshua says, I need to pass on something. I want them to know and to choose God for the long term. I don't want them to, be, to have to be pulled around and, and babysat and guided the whole time. Let's give them the tools to choose. Today I wanna to talk about us having a long-term choice for God, some principles in this chapter that we can apply to our own lives. Um, but before we get into it, let's just say a quick word of prayer. Um, dear Jesus, I just want to thank you so much that we have the Bible that we can learn on, um, we can reflect on, and as, as we tie our lives to the Bible, you can make uh, new things in our life. Um, send your Holy Spirit here, speak life in, into us, and help us to come out uh, on the path to, to your change. In your name we pray, amen. All right, what does it mean to choose? Uh, this is from the Merriam-Webster's Dictionary. To choose is to select freely and after consideration, to have a preference for or to decide. You guys are very familiar with what this looks like. Uh, most of you guys chose what you're going to eat for breakfast. Uh, if you were or not going to eat breakfast, uh, what you wore. Um, I have this uh, tradition with my wife that has formed uh, since coming to Cala Mesa. And every Friday, well, when we can, I go into the room, and she goes into the room, and I, I start trying on clothes for her, because we need to make sure that I'm at least matching at church, right? Um, it has happened where uh, we didn't get that Friday time, and I come home after church, and she says, like, what made you decide to wear those shoes? And I said, choices, I don't know. Um, so we have this tradition where she helps me to choose that. And we, we, we get to choose these things, and a lot of our choices we make every day are smaller and a little more insignificant. Uh, we make a choice and it's not life-changing, but then there are heavier choices. Um, choices for some of our high school and college kids of like, what am I gonna do? Uh, where am I gonna go? Who am I gonna date? Like, these are, these are kind of bigger, heavier choices. Who am I gonna marry? Like, let's hope we get that one right, right? So we have all these choices, some of them are smaller, some of them are bigger. And then in our Christian tradition, there's this other choice, and it's to choose God. Oh, I'm so sorry. To choose God. And that seems to be a really complicated choice. And this is why. We say we're going to choose God, and even though we choose him, like, our, our actions and just the way life works, it ends up that, like, we go counter to what we choose. Um, I got baptized when I was uh, five years old. Um, it was at an evangelistic series, and I was very excited because I had chosen God, which meant I was going to live for God, which meant, uh, and my, 
understanding of, of the gospel and faith maybe wasn't as mature as it was, um, it meant I was not going to sin. So I decided I'm going to go as long as I can without sinning. Like, that's just the job now. Like, that's my job. Um, and the first day was chill because like, I was like walking on the clouds, walking with the angels, doing good. And as time got by, it got really hard. And I realized that like the only way for me to not sin was just to lock myself in my room. Like, not talk to people. I might get mad at someone. And eventually I did. Why is choosing God so hard? Um, it wasn't until I was in high school where, like, my actual faith was very solidified. I knew my Bible. I knew what I wanted. And I said, God, like, my life is your life. And I, I find myself um, uh, bullying others, doing things I'm not supposed to. And I said, man, the thing that I chose, I can't even stick to that choice. I, I finally uh, become a pastor, and I, I did my first uh, halftime church, halftime school in Winnipeg. And before me, there was no chaplain at the school, and there was no youth pastor for a while at the church. So everything I did was like gold, even though it wasn't. Like I'd blink, and they'd be like, oh my goodness, this is the most amazing thing that's happened in Winnipeg. Um, and I was doing all these ministry things, doing it for God, and slowly pride started like getting into my life. And one day I'm just like, man, I'm the best youth pastor around. Um, mind you, I was the only youth pastor in the conference, so like, I could say that, but I said I was going to be serving God as a minister, and I was actually serving myself, serving my pride. There's something about choosing God that makes it really tricky. Have you guys experienced that? You choose one thing, and your life is not going the way you said it was going to go. Joshua knows this, so he's going to give us some wisdom here, and he brings all the people together, Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. The whole mass is there. Uh, I think we can safely assume that the leaders and the officers and the elders are closer to Joshua. They're the ones kind of in charge. And Joshua has them here at this place called Shechem. Now, Shechem is a place in Samaria, which actually still exists today. Um, and traditionally, you can see a lot of the Bible uh, archaeology stuff that happens there. So, uh, Shechem is a very important place biblically. Abraham, where he first sets up his tent and God says to him, Abraham, look up at the sky. Look at, up, look at the stars. I'm going to make a people for you, like a great nation. That happened at Shechem. A couple generations later, Jacob decides, you know what, God, like, I've been a deceiver, I've been lying, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give my life to you. I'm going to follow you. And he buries the idols of the family. He gets rid of the idols at Shechem. Uh, he, that, this is also the location where he builds a well, which later Jesus sits at the well talking to the Samaritan woman, saying, I am the living water. Uh, Joshua comes in with with take over on the mind and God gets rid of the Amorites and the Canaanites and all these guys. And when they get to Shechem, they give that city to the Levites and it becomes one of the three cities of refuge, um, which you can look up. That's a place where people who are wrongfully accused can run and find a uh, shelter. They can find sanctuary. Uh, this is a very special place, a location for a lot of God contacts with the people. And it is in this historical place that Joshua gives his speech. And the speech begins like this. And really, the speech is from God via Joshua. And I'm going to tell it to you in my own words. You can read it when you go home. A long time ago, there was a man named Terah. And he served other gods, not real ones, other gods. But through him, I called him out for a nation, and you know Father Abraham, the father of that nation. And I called him, and he became my people. Then Abraham had Isaac. And Isaac had Jacob and Esau. And Esau, I gave him a lot of land. Um, and Jacob, he ended in Egypt. And something happened in Egypt. They got trapped in slavery. So I, God, pulled them out with my, my servant Moses. And we pulled them out, and you were in the wilderness. And you were there, honestly, for a long time. You were there for a while, but then the conquering began. And I took you to the land I had promised. And we went city by city, town by town, and I cleared the way. They couldn't do anything about it. 
They even wanted the kings, Balak, and Joshua mentions this, he even went to a prophet, one of my guys, Balaam, and he said, hey, I'll give you money to curse Israel. And so he called on me, and you know what I did for you, Israel? I said, nah, I'm not going to curse them. I'm going to bless them. And so you were blessed, and you conquered, and now you are here in the promised land. And God makes the statement, I gave you a land on which you had not labored, and cities that you had not built, and you dwell in them. You eat the fruit of vineyards and olive orchards that you did not plant. God says, this is your history, but I want you to know something. I did it for you. The place where you are now, this promised land, I gave it to you. I think that um, in our lives, we can see the ways that God has blessed us. I hope so, at least. And honestly, in my, in my personal experience of 25 years, the times when I haven't seen that, I just really wasn't reflecting on my life that much. Um, if you're living a life where you are trying to get close to God, he turns up for you. Graces that you don't deserve, you are given. Things that... Uh, or go your way because of God are given to you, and God says, I did that. And all we got to do is name that and tell people about it. That's why, like, I'm sure some of you guys are sitting here. Uh, since January, we've done this series, and honestly, you probably have heard the history of Israel seven times from Pastor Ken, from Pastor Viana, from me, and every week we come up here and we tell the story over and over again. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, done, done, done. But this is important because when we want to make a long-term choice for God, the first thing we need to acknowledge is we need to name what God has done for you. Tell other people what God has done for you. It, you, you there's a bunch of people in church here, and some of you guys know each other, some of you guys don't. Um, and I try to challenge my youth, like, hey, talk to strangers. I'm like, what do you talk about? Man, talk about what God has done for you. He's done something for you. So, uh, they're all in captivated with the story, and Joshua is delivering it with, with gusto. And at this brink, like, I did it for you, Joshua says, Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river in Egypt. Serve the Lord. Um, there's a verb there that happens three times. The verb is, I just want to see if you can find it. Serve. serve. The verb is serve. And this is what, uh, I guess, uh, because of the way it is in English, there's a, a big connection to slavery in there. Um, so we're just going to talk about what it really means in fullness, uh, not exclusively in slavery means a work performed or made for another out of obligation, requirement, or gratitude. Um, in the Old Testament times, when you serve someone, you do stuff for someone. Uh, in slavery, obviously, it's more obligatory. Uh, you could get hurt. Um, you could get killed. And then sometimes, like with your wife, it's, it's more of an option, and hopefully you choose it. Um, to serve, you do something for others. Now, Joshua says, we got to serve, we got to do something, and then he gives us options. Uh, you have three options to choose from. Choose this day whom you will serve, and this is a famous verse, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, uh, when I was studying this and I was reading the passage for the first time, for some reason, my brain had like canceled the whole middle part of that verse. Like the way I memorized it was, choose this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But really here, Joshua gives options. And he gives them three options that we're going to walk through together. The first option is serve the God of your fathers. That first thing I have up there, serve the comfortability of our past and the habits we have learned. Uh, 
Because of the beautiful na nature of humans to be able to pass on history and pass on habits, uh, our second nature is just to do what we're taught. It comes in emotions. Uh, that's why kids will often get like, oh, you're just like your dad. You're just like your mom. Or you're definitely a recalled it, whatever they say. Um, sometimes it happens in our, our faith habits as well. Uh, we learn to, to pray a certain way and to, to do things a certain way. And we get that um, from our parents or from uh, the people who trained us, our habits. And sometimes, though, we have bad habits. We have bad worship habits. Maybe we even have false ideas of who God is. That's the first thing we, one of the options, to just keep on that route. And that leaves us comfortable. It can leave us enjoying life. Or we're not challenging maybe our family, our friends. Stay comfortable. That's one option. This is the second option. The God of the Amorites in the land you have taken. Serve the ways of the people around us and the priorities of today's changing world. So God brings this Israelites and he brings them to this new land. And in this land, there are a bunch of tribes and people, and all these bunch of tribes of peoples have lots of gods. And God's, Joshua says, that's one option for you. You can worship one of those gods. What does that mean for us? I think in our life, especially in today's like 21st century of technology, we get to see the whole world. And the whole world is yelling at us, choose my lifestyle. We see it on social media when it comes to fashion. We have to choose, choose my lifestyle. Sports, the way we talk, the way even, man, as a pastor, like when I have people interested in God, I can't just say Google sermons on YouTube. You can't do that because you could hear any kind of message you want. There's so much out there in the world and if we just pick and choose, we might be listening to the wrong thing. There's so much vying for our attention. That's one option. What does that lead to, though? That could lead to popularity. It could lead to being in the right, class, in the right group of people, being up to date, knowing what's going on, being modern, being in the times. And then there's this other option. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And this is directly opposite of those two. We can serve God who asks us to change uncomfortably and completely, differently from the world around us. So, um, God lays out this choice, or Joshua lays out these choices. What will you choose? And I think for us Christians, like obviously we want to choose the third option, right? That's the right answer. If you guys were wondering, it's the third option. And the people of Israel are not dumb either. So they say, Joshua, us too. We will serve the Lord as well. And uh, you can read this on, on your way home. Uh, Joshua says, uh, good, but actually you can't. And he kind of gives a little snippet of like how our works can't save us and how we need something more, how we need God, how we need grace. It's very interesting. Um, I'm not going to talk about that today, but I encourage you uh, to go home and, and look at that. So he says, okay, you, 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 you want to do that? You can do that. Because now the people here are naming what they will do for God. They're saying, I don't want option one. I don't want option two. I want option three. Now, this is tricky for us because we don't go home and like, you're not going to go home from the sermon, go to your house and pick up your, your gold statue and be like, oh, I guess I don't want to use this anymore and chuck it. It doesn't work like that for us, right? We live in a different time. And we need to name the gods we have in a tangible way. Okay, this is where God gets really tricky because God is intangible. You know what that means? Like you can't touch him, you can't see him, but you can think about him. But humans are very tangible. We're bad at thinking. When we think, we make mistakes. We, we do dumb stuff, right? So we're good at tangible things. We can make things. We can create, like, like, okay, not create, but you know what I mean. We can, we can do stuff. Um, and when we think about God, in our life, we can't just say, I'm going to choose to follow God because our, we'll just end up doing stuff. When we say, I choose to follow God, we have to make it tangible. So we got to name things. Like, because I follow God, right now, I am really working on not lying. Because I follow God, right now, this is the choice I'm going to make. I'm going to spend more time in the Bible. I'm going to spend 10 minutes a day praying. 
we're tangible people and we need to name what we'll do for God in a tangible way. All right, so we tell people what God has done for us. We name what we're going to do. Uh, the, the, people, the people do this, say, we're going to do it, Joshua. And Joshua gets excited. So he says, then put away the foreign gods that are among you and incline your heart to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, the Lord our God we will serve and his voice we will obey. The first time I was reading this um, in my little journal that I read when I write on when I sermon prep, I wrote, where did the idols come from? Because this people has been with Moses and Joshua for like a, a hundred plus years. And somehow they still have these idols just lying around. Maybe some scholars say they picked them up on the journey or, or they made them or, or somehow they kept them. Ellen White kind of comments that some people publicly proclaimed Yahweh, but at home they secretly worshiped their idols. And Joshua says, put them away. Get rid of them. Um, Growing up, there was this amazing thing that my mom had in our pantry, and it was the snacks, the snacks section. And like, I know you guys have a Costco card too, so you know what I'm talking about, but my mom, like if there was a Costco snack, it was in our house. If there was ice cream, it was in our house. So growing up, I had endless, endless amount of snacks, okay? Uh, I went to college, I did not have those funds, and now that I'm married, I I just don't want to eat snacks all day, you know? So I don't have that in my house. But sometimes in my house, there's a little, there's a little cabinet where I put snacks in for the month. Me and Alina will buy like crackers and chips and chocolate and we'll put it in there. And we're like, this is our snacks for the month. I open it on like day five and it's like empty. Where'd they go? When they're not there, I don't even think about it. I don't eat the snacks. Well, I mean, I can't. I, I don't want it. I don't desire it because the option's not there. When it's not with you, you, for, you forsake it. Now, there's something interesting that happens with me. This Christmas, I went home. I, I, I go to my house, and I open the pantry. And even though there's, like, we're grown adults, my parents still s stash the snack thing. I open the pantry. I'm like, snacks. And I start snacking Christmas break. I snack Christmas break. And my dad made a comment. He said, oh, Mark, you've been like this ever since you were a kid. You can't stop snacking. And I thought about it again. Like, I was offended, but then I thought about it again. And I was like, it was not me that changed. It was at home it's available. In, in here, like where my home is, it's not available. I don't do it. And... Joshua says, gives them this principle and says, you've got to forsake and remove the other. If you choose God or you choose a certain way of life, the other things can't be with you. Here's an example. Like, let's say uh, you decide that your choice for God is you want to stop looking at others for, for, your, for your pleasure, not your pleasure, for your, like, satisfaction and approval, and you're going to do that by cutting out social media, okay? But you keep Instagram on your phone, What's going to change? Nothing. Interesting principle there. Joshua says, you've got to forsake and remove the other. So they say, okay, we'll do that. Like, we'll do that. We'll worship God. Joshua, we are on board. And Joshua, I don't know if he was skeptical or if he was not. Nobody tells us. I, I like to think he was kind of like, mm, I'm just going to pray for you guys. Hopefully it works out. And Joshua says, fine. He gets a big stone, he puts it in front of a tree, and he says, behold, the stone shall be a witness against us, for it has heard all the words of the Lord that he spoke to us. Therefore, it shall be a witness against you, lest you deal falsely with your God. There's a principle here that I think this is the key to having a long-term relationship with God, and it's the principle of having a witness. What does that look like? For them, in this place of Shechem that was culturally, historically important, there was a huge rock with maybe inscription on it that every time they passed it, they said, oh yeah, I chose to follow God. What does that mean for us? Maybe we're choosing something with regards to, to a character trait of anger or maybe a character trait of social media. Or maybe it's a bad health habit. We need to find witnesses to keep us accountable. And honestly, the best witness you can find is a person. Because other things you can kind of ignore, people are just annoying. But if you have a person on your side, a person as your witness, they can keep you accountable for that choice. Um, I want to tell you guys a story 
uh, that is about tithe. The sermon is not about tithe, but in my life, these principles played out with tithe. I grew up in a home that was great because my parents really taught me the importance of giving to God first. Birthday money, uh, chore money, or for mowing the lawns of neighbors. As soon as I got money, I had to give 9%. No, 10%, 10%, okay? Nobody even said anything, okay? 10%, it's 10%. 15, actually, 15, maybe? No, 10%. So I, I would do that, and I got in this habit. I got my first job working at McDonald's when I was 14. Come home, my dad says, hey, that paycheck, what's the first thing you can do? 10%. My parents trained me well. I get to college, um, and I'm at college, and money's really tight now. I'm away from home. I have rent. I have gas. I have uh, going out with friends. I have uh, buying clothes. I have all this stuff, right? And the money's not enough, so I decide... Not like intentionally, but I just stopped giving tithe. I just like, there wasn't enough money anyways. And almost every month I'd have to call my mom asking for like $100, $200, just to make ends meet, right? And I remember one day my mom called me, maybe this is the second year in, in university, and she says, Mark, are you paying tithe? And I go, uh, not, I don't have money to pay tithe. And then my mom did really interesting, something interesting. She reminded me of all the things God has done for our family with money so that we could be blessed. How in times when my, my dad lost his job, we always gave tithe and God blessed us. Without her knowing, she named what God has done for us. And I listen, I'm like, you know what? That's like a good point. I'm going to start giving tithe. But I owe God a lot of tithe because I haven't given tithe for a while. So I did the math and I said, Mom, can you let me borrow all the money I owe God? But I also want you to know that you're going to have to step up like the help if I'm giving tithe. Because like I still had a job, it just wasn't enough. And my mom's like, hey, tithe first. So I, I got this money from my mom of all that I owed God. And I, I gave my down payment of tithe. And I started giving tithe again. And... I found that, like, I, now it's like just not a lot of money. Um, and I had to do something very painful for me. I had to be smart about my money. Now, because I felt guilty about my mom giving me handouts, I couldn't just eat at McDonald's whenever I wanted. I couldn't just buy shoes whenever I wanted. I had to forsake the other things I was taking my money, like, you know, taking my money. That's what it's doing, right? You think it's making you look nice. It's just taking your money. I had to forsake that. And now, like, I think I became, like, a pretty constant tithe giver. Uh, I moved to California, and I'm a Canadian, so I can't work, which means I don't have to pay tithe, right? Like, that's great. Um, but being here, there's been, like, a lot of kind people at this church, at the school, places, who are helping me with life, like, financially. And, like, if that's you in the crowd, I just want to say thank you. That's amazing. Um, and so I was telling my mom about this, and my mom asked me this question. She said, are you paying tithe on that? Now, whether you or not you believe in, in paying tithe on gifts or not, that's not important, right? My mom said, are you going to pay tithe on that? And this is what I said, mom, like, I'm 25. This is actually what I said. This was this week. Mom, I'm 25. I think I know how to pay tithe, okay? And my mom's going to watch this, and she's going to laugh, because, like, in my head, I was like, come on. Like, I'm a grown adult. I'm a grown Christian I'm a pastor mom, like just chill, okay? But then as I was studying this, I realized what my mom was doing was she was being my witness. And the reason why tithe in my life has just been a constant long-term choice was because all of these principles have applied in my life. Now, there's something important to note in this. Whatever choice you want to make for God, these principles can only happen with other people around you. If there's no one around you, you can't name what God has done for you. Like, I mean, I guess you could talk to yourself, but that removes the power from it, right? Where's the excitement in telling people, this is what God has done for me. And because of that, this is what I'm going to do for God. You need people for that. When, also, when you are doing stuff for God and, and forsaking others, what that looks like in our tangible world is usually in the interactions you have with other people. You need interactions to serve God, right? To do stuff for God. And you need other people to be a witness for you. 
Joshua is there, and he's 110 years old. And I'm sure there's a lot going on in his heart. But he knows that this people can long term be followers of God together if they choose God and support each other together. So, will we choose to serve God together? Um, Please pray with me. Uh, Dear Jesus, I want to choose to serve you. Um, I want to to follow you and all the other stuff that's distracting me, God, I really want to get that out of the way. Uh, But I can't choose you and be successful without the people around me. So God, I pray that as a church also, um, we each choose to follow you and collectively support each other, be a witness to each other, hold each other accountable so that we can all choose you and continue in that choice. Thank you so much for blessing us. In your name we pray, amen.